Okay, we're recording. Lucy, how are you doing today? Doing good. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Whereabouts in the world are you today? I'm in Philadelphia, in my house, where I live. <laughs> it's so weird. You're the second podcast I've done today, uh, and the one that I've done previously, uh, my guest uh, spent all of his kind of early years up to he was 20 in Philadelphia. So yeah, F- Philly's... Oh, who was uh, it? Philly, uh, his name's Jim Benner. He's... um. He, he, he worked uh, at, at XFM in the UK for years and uh, and he's now heading up um, War Child and he's doing lots of, uh, he's just released a, a record with loads of kind of indie acts from the UK for uh, a Christmas uh, album for War Child. But yeah, bizarre. Cool. Philadelphia. Two yeah, that is day. weird. I'll be interested to know what the home county act is then. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. First things first. The song with the greatest ever intro, please. I chose, and I'd be surprised if nobody else chose this, but Let's Go Crazy by Prince. Um, I feel like that's the most memorable intro of any like record that I've heard. I'll be honest with you. It's, I think of all of them, that's probably been chose the most. Dang I it. Think, I uh, feel like I should uh, choose a different one. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're saying with the greatest intro and everybody agrees that it's Let's Go Crazy. Then well, let's that's talk it. about that, like, though, because yeah. let's not, we can never gloss over Prince. It's uh-huh. like there's, there's too much to discuss. But I think the reason I, I think I mean, I say a lot of people have chosen. It. I've done 350 of these, Lucy, and wow. I think maybe five people have chosen that. So it, it's okay. not. And and it it deserves its place there because it's. I think you get songs that have got like slow kind of gradual um, kind of intros. And then you've got like your beat was helped, which is just bang straight in. And I think this kind of does both. You kind yeah. of, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like him being like dearly beloved. You're like, wait, I was trying to hear a song. What am I actually listening to? And it takes you out of like your usual listening experience. And it puts you into just like, a human experience um and i feel like he like takes people on a journey like that's what he's trying to do in his music and with his records anyways um my mom actually like saw prince and uh there was like a she says like 20 minute part of the show it was probably more like two minutes where he like left the stage and was just chanting from off stage like i am god i am god <laughs> and uh her little Christian brain just like blew up at that. Is this something you, you're going to potentially factor into some of your future live shows? Just chanting that I am God. Why not? <laughs> Throw it out there. Hmm. Maybe if I get promoted <laughs> to God, then I'll uh, I'll let people know. But I think with, with that intro, you, you do get that where it takes you into that sort of that human area, and like, and you just get caught up in that. But when the song kicks it really kicks doesn't it yeah yeah you're held like in suspension until the song really kicks in yeah and you really get the payoff I think yeah also like let's go crazy could be a really like vapid type of sentiment but because of the intro it makes it really deep it's like you know life is such a like precious and momentary thing yeah so let's just choose to go crazy you're a big prince fan yeah i'm a huge prince fan how did that come about my mom loves prince i mean i just said she went to one of the shows but yeah i i grew up with a lot of christian music and a lot of musical theater and then also prince because my mom and bruce springsteen because my dad but yeah it was like one of the like weirdest musicians that my parents had in the house yeah um and I just I love him was it a, a aside from sort of that sort of thing was it a musical household was it was was there music on a lot yeah my mom is a pianist so she was playing piano a lot doing lessons um she works like four jobs. She's an elementary school music teacher. She plays piano for theater. She teaches piano and she plays piano in church. So it's all all music. And my dad plays guitar and um, he'll like put on songs that he likes and like play along. That's kind of his his jam. 
So there was always instruments laying around in the house. Mm -hmm. Would you be picking them up at an early age? Um, my mom tried to teach me piano when I was like five and she'd be like, this is a C and I'd be like, no, it isn't. And she's like, okay, I have no patience for you. You don't deserve my, my knowledge. You don't deserve, I don't deserve you talking to me like that. So, um, yeah, I never learned piano. Um, and I wasn't really interested in guitar either until like middle school. Yeah. Like it just seemed like, uh, I don't know why it didn't occur to me. I think maybe I thought like, oh, my dad does that. Dudes do that. Like my chance was with piano because like girls play piano and I missed it. So yeah, I didn't really like untie that knot until later. You you mentioned that your mom had four jobs and you, you've chosen industry to, to, to pursue that is famously very, very difficult. Um, would you say sort of seeing, you know, that kind of, work ethic had an effect on you yeah i think so she's a very busy lady i feel like her busyness is part of her personality at this point yeah. like she doesn't know what to do with herself in downtime so she's always always working and she does always like ask about work and drilled it into me and my brother like you have to support yourself like at first, like my parents were not excited about me doing music because they were like, you're not going to make a living. Um, and now that I pay my rent with music, they're very pleased. But um, yeah, that was like a, a major priority growing up is being like financially able to take care of yourself. Well, well, well let's go back to, to, to those early earlier times. And, and I'm going to ask you now for track two, please, to, to tell me the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you, please. So my first answer was the Phantom of the Opera soundtrack, which is not one song, but okay. um, like I said, my mom like plays piano for musicals and she had that CD, which was like a double CD. And I would listen to it from like top to bottom and just like lay on my floor and cry as I was like eight years old. Um, but I think uh, beyond an entire soundtrack, um, I remember hearing Five Years by David Bowie Wow. and feeling really affected by that affected hair what would the emotion be well i felt like uh it was just different than anything i had heard and maybe it was like one of the first songs that uh didn't make sense to me immediately because you know like growing up with like these really uh like in church and in musicals, like the lyrics have to be so understandable because you're like trying to send a very specific message. There's a lot of repetition. It's really simple. Um, whereas like the writing of that one was more like poetic and artful. And uh, like, even though I didn't really get what was going on, I felt like this mournful feeling. And also like his voice was edgy. Like it didn't, it wasn't like pristine the way that like I'd been taught a voice sounded good. Um, and I think that like, I mean, that song has to do with like the passing of time and like the rarity of time. And I was always obsessed with death as a kid and like loss, like any kids movies that had like allusions to loss, I just like would rewatch over and over. Um, so yeah, you, I just why do, like- Why do you think that was? I think, uh, probably had to do with like growing up in church and being asked to think about death at an early age um not really in a sad way because it was like you're not actually gonna die like you're you're saved um but still like the concept was brought into my life at an early time so i was probably trying to just like grapple with it like recently i was thinking about that disney movie the fox and the hound i don't know if you ever saw that mm -hmm. but it's like they're friends but then at the end of the movie like they can't continue their friendship because they just live in different worlds and it's just like them leaving each other and it's like not a happy ending in the slightest and i would just like rewind the end and like make myself cry or like a little later in life there's this book bridge to terabithia where one friend dies and i don't know if i was like trying to poke at that part of myself to like get used to it because i knew it was going to happen and I wanted to like get ahead of the game in terms of knowing how to mourn. But yeah, I think that this song kind of like poked at the same part of me. 
And, and the way that you described sort of Bowie and, and, and specifically that track five years, like for most kids, when a song presents itself that isn't, let's say, Madonna, you know, that, that kind of, you know, formulated, you know, instant hooky pop that's spelt out in front of you, most kids would be like, uh, fuck this, I don't make any sense to me. Like, g- yeah. g- g- give me some more pop because it's it's you know it's it's easy but why do you think you kind of persevered with something that wasn't quite as straightforward I think it had enough qualities of what I usually listen to because it is kind of dramatic Mm. and it's theatrical and it does have this like repeated part and the way that he sings like he sings a bit like an actor and he also talks about actors in the song and um yeah, I think it was just like sort of a, not in the bad way, but like a perversion of what I did know and love. Yeah. And um, I don't know, kind of like switched the tracks on maybe where my taste was going. And yeah. I'm glad for it. Two eyes that died in the same year as well. Yep. Prince died on my birthday. Wild. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that weren't a good day. <laughs> no. I, I, was, uh, I was in Vienna, of all places. And... Yeah. Uh, and there was no, sort of, you know, British speaking TV. And uh, so I just slung the news on like first thing in the morning. And I think the phone then went and it, it was like my wife and kids were like phoning me up to say happy birthday. And I just sort of glanced to the screen and the subtitles was just like Prince dies. And I was like, fuck, Prince is dead. Like, yeah. this is, and, and both people like Prince and Bowie, they both to me, they're going to live, you know, they, they were going to live forever. They, you know, oh, yeah. they, they, they're not, they're not human. They're like, yeah. there's something different. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're cultural zombies. Yeah. <laughs> That's a perfect description. <laughs> That's exactly what they are. <laughs> um, I'm using that. I'm having that. One. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> cool. Um, well, also stand in the formative years for track three. I'm going to ask you please to uh, tell me the song that reminds you of your time at school, please. So I'm going to say just like heaven by the cure. Oh, and obviously not because it came out while I was in school, but um, my first boyfriend who I met at church camp, actually my song VBS is about this guy. He showed me the song. He's like, this is our song. And I loved it so much. I'd play it all the time. And even after we broke up, we were in eighth grade. It wasn't really a breakup. Um, I went to high school and like everyone knew I loved the cure. And so any person that I dated would independently be like, just like heaven is our song and i couldn't be like actually i have that's me and my ex's song like we can't we can't have it so like yeah it just kept recirculating as this romantic thing but with like many different people and i just kind of had to keep it to myself that like <laughs> ultimately the song is mine and yeah. like everybody yeah. else can just do what they want um and i also had a band uh my high school band are actually the people that still record me and uh before they asked me to like fully join the band i would just come up and sing just like heaven with them and there was this day where we were playing at like a local venue in richmond i live in philly but i'm from richmond virginia and like the whole crowd there were like 12 people that i either dated or was currently dating or wanted to date me and it was very stressful so uh it it felt like a like the hijinks of a bad teen TV show. So that song always kind of makes me laugh. Every one of them people thought you was playing that for them, right? Yeah. Yeah, like one foot on the lip of the stage, like fist in the air. like. Um, and two of my friends afterwards like came up on stage and like took me out and were like, we're leaving. You need to get out of that situation. So um, yeah, I don't know if anybody ever really figured it out. Oh, incredible. Incredible. Do you know what? Mentioning that Prince died on my birthday, I also share my birthday with Robert Smith. There you go. Another bizarre, wow. bizarrely stupid. Uh, what? When is your birthday? birthday? April the 21st. April 21st. So you're a uh, Taurus? I am. I am. I'm a Taurus. Oh, are you? May 2nd. All oh, right. So yeah. what, what, what? I mean, I don't actually ever kind of look into that. I think we're meant to be, are we meant to be quite stubborn? Stubborn, but also like stable. You know, I think that we, yeah. we really, uh, the vo- we do... my, my, my voice changed then stubborn. <laughs> and you went, uh, yeah. And kind of quite balanced. I was like, yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> I went all mm-hmm. balanced then. <laughs> That's me. Why. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're supposed to be good hosts. We're supposed to give good advice. We can be uh, annoyingly stubborn. Um, for some people, boring, just because like we know what we want. And some people think that that's boring but yeah excellent well let's let's um before we start i want i want to ask about school but uh first of all can we just bang on a little bit about how fucking incredible the cure are oh yeah let's i would that. love to do that yeah <laughs> i feel like they're i see them as a big influence on me and i don't know if other people can tell that like um like hot and heavy the whole end section I feel like is very similar to their song Close to Me that mm-hmm. I also love. And nobody's called me on it. I mean, it is different enough, but I was definitely like thinking about Close to Me when we were recording that. They've got some intros. Mm-hmm. They've got so many good, I mean, just like Heaven's a great intro as well. Yeah. That little synth line over the top, that's the payoff. When that drops, it's like, oh, there's a euphoria right there. Yeah, oh, yeah. God. Mm-hmm. Have you seen them? I saw them at Lollapalooza in 2013, I think. And it was like the best day of my life. And this guy kept trying to chat me up and be like, yeah, I love the cure too. You want to dance? And I was like, no, go away. I'm having an experience. I waited for this. I never thought this was going to happen. Um, but yeah, I next time they announce a tour, I'm just buying a ticket to wherever yeah. I can see them. Yeah, I, I saw them. Um, maybe just before the lockdown in the UK, um, wow. in, in Hyde Park, and I've seen them quite a lot to be honest, Lucy. And I, I see them, I first see them on the Wish Tour, I think, like because wow. I'm well old. Like, I, I saw them then, and they, if I remember rightly, they encore with Foxy Lady. Um, but wow, um, but the last time I see them, I've seen them a few times where they've just kind of when like blood flowers come out and they kind of just wigged out a lot, and it was mm-hmm. like it. it and it went on for a long time, and, and I'm a huge fan, but it was like, okay. But the last time I see them, they literally just went, right, this is a big park, and let's just give you all the hits and all Aww. the hits that you want. And it was just a beautifully sunny day, which doesn't happen very much in the UK. Uh, mm. Oh, and they just deli- – I think they come on to Pictures of You, and it was just like – Oh, my God. Here we go. And uh, and yeah, they just didn't come off the gas. It was just incredible. And it was one of them, one of them gigs where I kind of caught. I'm actually looking at my. I've got a little picture <laughs> here on the wall. I've got the, the, I've got a little signed picture of this integration. I've oh my god! Like, it's got Robert written on it. But um, wow! But yeah, it was like it was such a good gig. It was like all the bands. It was such an old man gig for me. It was. Um, I've got, I've got I caught up with all of my old pals like, oh, from cool. when we were young. Uh, and it was, who was it? It was the Cure, Slow Dive, Ride. It was like all of the bands from wow. like the shoegaze early 90s stuff. And it was Ugh. like, I'm going to get to revisit it all again. And uh, yeah, a lot of them. I'm so of... jealous of you. <laughs> it was really, oh, Interpol were playing as well. Yeah. Oh my God. Was, uh, <laughs> yeah, Gold Frap. It was, it was a good day. It was a good day. But uh, anyway, I digress. I've somehow I'm banging <laughs> on about myself, which isn't what I'm meant to be doing on this podcast. I mean, you're banging on about the cure, and that's always fine by me. Oh, good, good. Um, mm. Tell me about school. How was it? Was it uh, a good experience? I actually liked school. I was a huge nerd, and I, well, I liked high school. Um, I went to this, I like tested into this nerd school basically. So everyone there was nerdy and so nobody was, and I was a lot more comfortable than I was in middle school. I was like part of the kind of like preppy group in middle school and I just didn't fit in and they definitely let me know. Um, but yeah, I I kind of got through high school like without hating it too much. Um, I still like, go back there sometimes and see teachers and um, it has a really long name. It's called the Maggie L. Walker Governor School for Government and International Studies. Jesus so, Christ. That yeah. must be pretty. That's going to take up half a page on your headed paper. Yeah, it's like nine words, I think. Ten words. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. 
<laughs> did you um did you know what you wanted to be when you was at school? Um, I wanted to be a therapist for a while. Um, okay, which I think is cool, and the world definitely needs therapists. But any teenager that's like, yeah, I should be a therapist, like you have to be a little bit maybe like egotistical. I think it's just because I've always been the friend that other friends come to for advice or to like to tell secrets. And like, I do like that about myself and it satisfies like the gossip within yeah. that I get to know everybody's secrets and hold them. Um, and that's a Torian trait, right? Yes, to be like the keeper of all. I think nice. that we, we thrive in control. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, did, I never really thought I would do music, even like a year into doing like after my first record came out, I kind of like saw it as a fluke and thought like this will be a cool experience until it's over and then I'll do really? something else. Yeah, no, this doesn't make any sense. It's starting to make sense because I'm like, okay, I've been doing this for five years now and I have three records and two EPs and I tour all the time. So like it my life makes sense, but for many years, it really didn't to me. I talked to lots of musicians about this and, and do, do, you, do, you, do you get that imposter syndrome of like, how, how am I here? How am I doing this? Um, yes, not maybe the same way that other people do. Like I know how I wrote my songs. Like I, I don't get imposter syndrome about being myself. Um, because that's all I know how to do. Um, and that is basically my job title. But I do sometimes like enter a space that's very fancy. And I'm like, I wonder who's going to turn around and be like, wait, how did you get here? You're not supposed to be here. Um, but I, I kind of love like really weird, different experiences. So I try to just enjoy it and be like, if I'm here, I'm meant to be here. So might as well like not spend the evening self hating. Do you, do you actively kind of look for, you know, if an experience sort of presents itself, are you always leaning on the side of yes? I'm trying to do that more because my impulse is no. My impulse is like, stay still, another Torian trait. <laughs> like stay home, like do something comfortable. Um, just like getting a book and my tea sounds awesome. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> finished my tea before we started. But um, yeah, I, uh, I'm i trying to just say yes more. And it has brought me to some really cool scenarios. Wonderful. Track four, the first song you may buying from a record store, please. Let me look on my list. Well, OK. I. If you're not talking about vinyl, the first CD that I bought was from Target and it was American Idiot by Green Day. Okay. And the first song on that record is American Idiot. So I feel like that might be the real answer. Cool. So um, would that have been, how old would you have been then? Um, maybe 10. Right. Yeah. So would you, I mean, I guess, you know, we, we spoke about Bowie, but it was was the kind of sort of, the alternative side of, of of music and that appealing more to you you know at, the, at them formative years more so than the more kind of mainstream pop already yeah i definitely was trying to build my own music taste um and actually my parents heard like all the curse words it was like the unedited version and they threw it away and uh i still don't have it i've thought about how like if i see that anywhere i should just buy it like as a full circle moment um but then they tried to make up for it and they gave me a jason mraz cd who we actually went to the same middle school um really and yeah it was like hometown pride he wasn't like super famous at that time either um yeah so they were like sorry we threw away your green day cd here's jason mraz but then on the inside, there was a picture of him, like we took off the plastic wrap and there was a picture of him and he had like a pin on his jacket that said, I heart sex. My mom grabbed it and blotted it out with a Sharpie and then handed it back to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, you, you know, I, I'm going to ask this question with the greatest respect, but how, how did you find like 
that kind of um what's the word um censorship i guess um i didn't like it but i didn't have like a really big rebellious phase um i think it just seemed like too much trouble and like my mom was always threatening punishment and so i knew her boundaries really well and so i would just kind of like take what i could get when i could get it yeah. um because also i think i it's like weird I, I think that i was a good kid but also i was a very strategic kid and so i knew that i needed to stay like having my parents think i was a good kid in order for them to let me do anything at all yeah so I, I followed the major rules and then kind of like did what I wanted uh, when they weren't looking. <laughs> so what other stuff was kind of happening around then, you know, the, the time that you was buying Green Day, what other stuff was you, and, and where was you seeing this? Was like MTV allowed on at home and stuff like that? I would get home from school before my mom because she would have to like stay at her school until all the kids got picked up by their buses and stuff. And I would have like 30 minutes or something to watch anything on the TV. And uh, I would watch MTV and they always had like a artist of the month. I forget who they call it, what, like what it was called, but I remember finding Kate Nash from that and Adele from that and um, the Wombats, I think, um, Kings of Leon, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, so I was seeing like music videos because they were still yeah. doing music videos, TL TRL, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then also like neighborhood kids and like people on the bus. The bus was really like a huge ordeal as a kid because my middle school and the high school shared buses. And so you'd have kids that were like nine and kids that were like 18 on the bus together and like all the older kids would try to like corrupt the younger kids and like give them you know recommendations or like teach them dirty words and so maybe i got my green day recommendation from like a 10th grader on the yeah. bus and in regards to sort of record stores as you got older did the record stores become places and, and certainly now you know as, as an artist you know are you a fan of the independent record stores yeah definitely like in high school i would go at least once a week but in middle school like i grew up in kind of a country area and there weren't any uh record stores but then that nerdy high school that i went to was in the city and walking distance from a lot of cool things um so yeah that's when i like found out about vinyl and like vinyl was coming back and my, i asked my dad to fix his record player and um yeah i just like flipped through records with friends and all their dads were like cool, you know, like who liked The Cure and like Yola Tango and Wilco and uh, Radiohead. So yeah, in high school, I kind of started to inherit my friend's dad's taste basically. Yeah. You're making me sound really fucking old on that. <laughs> I just think you just rattled off uh, all of them that were like, yeah, that's what I was listening to when I was like 14, 15, 16. Shit, I'm yeah. Old. Uh, I mean, so was I, though. That's what <laughs> I was listening to when I was 14, 15, and 16. And now I still listen to all of those bands. All right. Well, let, let's talk about when you were maybe a little older, hopefully a little older, um, for track five, uh, the mm -hmm. song that soundtracked your years clubbing. And I should stress with this question, um, because generally I found that 80% of guests go, oh, I weren't really into clubbing. And, and I think that that's based on the kind of idea that it was, you know, that lost summer in Ibiza, you know, shirt off raving. This can be your local rock bar. This can be your local indie club. This can be any kind of, you know, space where, you know, you would dance and enjoy yourself in them sort of formative years. Yeah. I definitely went to a lot of local shows and I was trying to find songs from that time that like were on Spotify, but they don't exist. Like all those bands probably existed for like a year tops and never played shows outside of Richmond. But those were like my favorite songs. And we'd go see bands like every time they played and sometimes they'd play like twice a week in Richmond. Um, but yeah, I didn't really have a clubbing phase. I'm honestly interested. I wonder if my clubbing phase is yet to come. I would not be against it. Um, but there's two songs that 
we always played at parties that everyone would like gather for and just like freak out to and it's dance yourself clean by lcd sound system and uh you me dancing by los campesinos ah oh, wonderful there we still play those los campesinos i definitely associate to high school dance yourself clean we still play all the time and especially every new year's we time the drop to midnight oh really and, yeah wonderful yeah. so i even played a show new year's of into 2020 before we knew what the world was going to become and um i stopped my show and was like okay everybody like i'm not going to play the next song we're just going to put it over the speakers and we had all these balloons and like confetti and passed out champagne to everyone and it was very good Oh, I love that. What a wicked thing to do at your own show as well. Go, I'm not going to play my thing now. I'm going to play this and you're going to really like it. Oh, yeah. amazing. Amazing. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's take you home because for track six, Lizzie, I'm going to ask you please to tell me um, a favourite song from an artist from your home county, please. So I live in Philly now, but I'm from Richmond and I listen to Black Messiah by D'Angelo all the time. And I was trying to pick one song and I feel like really love is usually the one I would pick, but I'm going to pick um, Back to the Future Part One because it has a Richmond reference in it. And uh, D'Angelo is just so good. Like yeah. he has kind of like a mysterious like vibe. I feel like he, he's not always in the public eye. And I think that's by choice, um, but he's so good at everything. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mentioned earlier about you sort of choosing a, a you know, a famously uh, tough um, industry to, to, you know, to, to, to have success in and, and, and to reach the level of success that you've had and to have that amount of, sort of records under your belt is, is, is incredible. So would you say, I want to ask you about confidence. I want to ask you if you're confident. And then I also want you to tell me if you think you're driven. Hmm. Um, I actually think that I am confident. Uh, I don't think about it much though. <laughs> uh, I can tell when I'm not, and it's not the default. So I think the default's confidence. And then occasionally I feel very out of my element and like not good. Um, but yeah, I feel, I feel lucky that I usually Feel. I think that like overall, like I think that the stakes are pretty low about most things yeah. and that helps confidence. And also knowing that like everybody else around you is having their own internal dialogue. It's like, oh, okay, well, people aren't even paying attention to me probably because everyone's being self-obsessed. <laughs> so I can just kind of like the weights off. Um, and then the, the driven part. Yeah, I, I also think that I'm driven. <laughs> um, I think that I just enjoy making things happen. Um, and I don't think that I'm just driven like work wise, but I feel very driven to like maintain a certain level of joy in my life and like to encourage that in the people around me. And so my How work's part of that. Um, I feel like just noticing, uh, noticing how I feel and being like, I need to change something um and like noticing other people and getting to learn what makes everybody i love happy and like taking stock of that and being around to just like remind everyone that they could be happier um which i have a hard time doing these days because i travel so much it's hard to be around but um i do have this big drive to like set myself and everyone I love up with a life that they can be proud of. Wonderful. <laughs> Last track, Lucy, and this is where you get to play Tastemaker. Um, I'm going to mm -hmm. ask you please to tell me a song that you think many people may not know that you would like them to hear. I'm going to pick If You Met Her by Palehound. I don't know, have you heard this song? I haven't, no. Palehound are an incredible band and they opened for me um, for the first half of our fall tour that we just did in the US. And Ellen, the singer, is such an incredible writer and guitarist. And um, whenever I see them play, I'm like, 
how is this band not just huge you know like i i really feel inspired by ellen and the song uh it's about her meeting a new girlfriend within a time period of grief having lost a friend so holding these two emotions of like missing this person so much that meant so much to them but also having this like hopeful flighty feeling and trying to reconcile them and really mourning that like those two people will never meet it's really complex but it's also like catchy and yeah it's just really beautiful well we put together a a spotify playlist to accompany uh the the podcast lucy so we put on there uh, all of the tracks that um we've, we've spoken about today and and as we sort of come to the end of 2021 which you know and, and hopefully 2022 will be uh a more relaxed connected and and, and positive place than, than maybe the way this year started um with that in mind what are you looking forward to next year personally and what's going to be happening professionally hmm well i'll do professionally first i'm touring a bunch knock on plaster um and i will be coming to the uk and nice. hopefully to europe i mean again like fingers crossed because of covid um but the plan is that i'm going to be over there and we have a bunch of cool stuff planned that isn't announced yet and it's the best job ever so I hope it, it can all happen. Personally looking forward to, um, hmm, hmm, what to say that I'd be willing to share. I usually like to keep things like this so precious to me, but I do feel like there must be something. I mean, there's still a lot of people I haven't seen because of lockdown that I just wanna connect with and I wanna spend more time with my brother and um, a couple of friendships that have really withered that I think can just be watered and blossom again. So, yeah. Lovely. Lovely. That's a perfect way to finish. Um, cool. Lucy, um, thank you so much for giving up your time today. Uh, you've chosen some ridiculously brilliant records. Yay. And you're um, going to put the whole Phantom of the Opera soundtrack on the playlist. Yeah. And I'm going to put Just Like Heaven on there 14 times as well. Okay. <laughs> One for all of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and as soon as you come over to the UK, then I look forward to coming and, and, and watching your show. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so Same much. Same to you. Lucy. Yeah, great talk. Thank you. Right. Bye. I'm press stop on.